Welcome to Grow Brands and More, the podcast where curiosity meets insight to explore the frontiers of marketing. I am Filiberto Amati, your host. Every week we explore international marketing, consumer trends, and brand strategy. Whether you are an entrepreneur, a seasoned marketing professional, or fascinated by brands' power to shape our world, you come to the right place. In this space, we decode the secrets of growth, unravel the latest in brand innovation, and examine what makes consumer tick and brands memorable. From exclusive interviews with industry leaders to deep dives with mind shaping the future of marketing, Growth Brands and More is your go to source for insight and strategy that inspires action. Let's learn, grow, and inspire. Welcome to the new episode. My esteemed guest of today is a former Procter and Gamble marketing director, Edward Burgard. Welcome, Ed. Yeah, thank you. You had a very long career in Procter and Gamble, where you had several marketing and advertising roles, and then you were also selected as one of the few, actually, and first early Procter marketers, which were some sort of internal consultants or responsible for the marketing innovation within the firm, if I remember correctly. Yes, I can explain that further. Yeah, on. please. I think it's very interesting. Yeah, I, Procter & Gamble is an interesting company. And in general, the company doesn't do anything without researching a lot. And they hit a period where they were getting beat in the marketplace and they wanted to analyze why that was happening. And the common thread that they found was they were getting beat by former Procter and Gamble marketers. So they looked, the obvious question then became if they were, if they're good enough to beat us, why did we ever lose them? And what they discovered was their structure of using marketing to feed their general management rigs was getting in the way of keeping people who genuinely loved marketing. Essentially, Procter & Gamble is positioned as an upper out company. Once you hit a certain level, if there's no room to grow, our best people were leaving. So they decided to identify those quote unquote best people around the world. And they created this position called Farley Proctor Marketer to give them an honorific title and some additional responsibilities so that they could pursue their passion for marketing. I was blessed to be selected as one of the inaugural three. It was a, an appointment that was competitive. You had to be recommended by your business unit president and then finally approved by the Proctor & Gamble CEO and corporate marketing officer. The responsibilities varied. You were given a stipend to research an area of passion as long as it was related to marketing, um, which was cool. Um, but then you were also used internally uh, as part of a team to address uh, marketing issues around the world. To pick an example, if our Tide brand in Portugal was having a very hard time in the marketplace. The Harley Proctor marketers could be called in to sit with the local brand team, hear their issues, offer suggestions, and uh, hopefully put them on a path to success. So I got to travel to different parts of the world, got exposed to different parts of the company and the different marketing situations. So it, it was a really fun appointment and a, a high point in my career. Great. And when you actually left the company and retired, you started your own consulting and you wrote one, two, three books. Can you tell us a bit about that? The last three years at Procter & Gamble, I was an executive on loan and there's a little story behind that. The governor of the state of Ohio reached out to Procter & Gamble and wanted help in branding the state for capital investment purposes. And to make a long story short, I got 
tapped to uh, start a company. It was a not-for-profit company focused on, on marketing Ohio. I did that for the last three years of my time at Procter and Gamble. And then I retired from Procter and Gamble and I, I kept on as the CEO of that company for two more years. We had some very good success. I took the assignment because I was interested in better understanding whether everything I learned at Procter and Gamble from a branding perspective could be reapplied to what I perceived as a conceptual product. What is a state? What is a country? How do you get your arms around that? I thought, Here's an opportunity with no personal equity at risk to start a company. I was in my fifties. So I thought eh, that's pretty cool. And then here's an opportunity to explore an area that I would never have had the chance to do otherwise. So I thought, great. And under the worst case scenario, um, if it all failed, I would just end up back at Procter and Gamble. So I basically risked nothing to learn a lot. Um, what I did learn is that, uh, uh, everything, uh, that I understood about branding, uh, really does apply. Um, honestly, I was not shocked because Procter and Gamble has multiple business categories. And I had observed that the branding principles um, applied regardless of the category you were in. So the principles were accurate for soap. They were accurate for prescription pharmaceuticals where I spent my career. They were accurate for shaving. So I, I didn't see any differences in the principles, just differences in the application. And that's, it turned out to be the case as well in marketing the state. When I got done with that, I spent uh, my time doing that work was with three different governors and it was away from home. So after five years of being away from home, I decided to fully retire. And, um, I had formed some different perspectives on branding that I wanted to share with practitioners. I have a, a good relationship with Philip Kotler and Kevin Keller, two of the sort of recognized gurus in the branding world, but I had a bit difference of opinion with them and not to belabor it because it, this is really getting into the weeds, but I fundamentally believe that marketing is a subset of branding. All of their papers and books position branding as a subset of marketing. And I think they're wrong in that perspective. And I also think my way of looking at it answers a lot of questions that uh, non-professionals have about marketing and branding, how to go about it. I decided to write a book and share that perspective with the field, see if I could get some traction. I will tell you, um, since I wrote the book, what I would position as non-practitioners, small business owners, the C-suite with the exception of corporate marketing officers, when they look at it through my lens, things make a lot of sense for them. And probably the biggest issue that gets reconciled for them is the role of a brand promise and essentially what is a brand. That's been a challenging question. In fact, a little side story, when I first started with the uh, state of Ohio, I was up in front of a group of maybe 400 people and I had to give a talk on what I was doing and trying to accomplish and all that kind of stuff. And we got to the question answer period and somebody in the audience asked me, Hey, Ed, what's a brand? And I candidly, and this is in spite of having three decades of experience at Procter and Gamble. I candidly had a hard time responding in a way that the audience would understand. So I cheated. I just fell back to the textbook approach and talked about the space that you own in a person's mind and all this stuff. 
And I looked at the person who asked the question and I saw that I had confused them far more than I solved their question. It was ridiculous and I was embarrassed and I got out of it, but I didn't feel good about that. So I, I, I went about trying to figure out an answer that a lay person could actually understand. And I expressed that in the book. In, in the book, I talk about a brand as a promise. And I'm not the first to say that. It's supported in the literature. Anybody can do an online search and, and see there are other people that position it that way. But that positioning is pretty profound because everybody understands what a promise is. And regardless in the world, you know, of where you grow up, everybody knows it's good to keep a promise and it's bad to break a promise. So the game is pretty clear when you look at it that way. Now, there are some conditions, obviously, for it to be effective. It has to be relevant to the person you're speaking to. It has to be competitive. If you make a non-competitive promise, obviously you're not going to be selling much. But probably most importantly, it has to be authentic. And this is where I think marketing gets a bad rap in that people believe if they just say something about a product or a service or a person, if you say it enough at times that people will believe it. And in reality, it's just the opposite. If you say something inauthentic and you get people to try your product, it's the fastest way to kill your product because a lot more people realize that you're lying and word gets out and nobody else will want to try your product. So authenticity is absolutely critical. So in the book, I, I talk about that. And when I talk to people who don't really understand branding to any depth, and you may be shocked or not shocked, but there are a lot of CEOs that do not understand branding. Uh, that's how I make my money. Okay, well, exactly. I, I even talk to CMOs who don't understand brands. Yeah. Yeah, they, and it makes sense. CEOs come out of many different disciplines, which, you know, don't necessarily require them to study marketing as they're growing, as they're getting their education. The PhD way, you know, CEO, and most general management comes from marketing. In most other companies, right. that's not the case. Exactly. And in fact, even at Procter & Gamble, if, if you ask that question, they would have the same response that I did initially. And it, it, and I joke with my former colleagues, I said, it's like everybody drinks the same water and has an implicit understanding of what a brand is, but nobody can explain it. When I sat CEOs down and, and said to them, hey, look, a brand is a promise. It's not any harder than that. But it drives everything you do. So if you have a product, and we'll make it simple, a one product company. If you have a product and you know what the promise is of that brand that compels consumers to want to purchase it, then your company purpose is to make sure that promise is met at each and every touch point along the line. So it should drive all of your strategic choices, including organizational design choices. And that was, I found to be fundamentally different than a lot of the literature that I read. And you can ask my wife, I have way too many business books, but it is so true. I think it, and it will cause very different decisions to be made if you adopt that paradigm. It, it also gives you a reason, I'll say a directed reason to go about organizational development because any move you make, the, the fundamental question is how does it help or hurt the delivery of the brand promise? And, and I don't care if we're talking about the finance department or the manufacturing department or the sales department, 
all of it has to in some way contribute toward delivering the brand promise. And I think equally important, those department leaders need a clear understanding of how their work contributes to delivering the promise. Because once they understand that, other decisions that they have to make internally are directed towards that delivery as opposed to some nonsensical or theoretical benefits that, that they believe that they can derive by reorganizing or redeveloping or whatever. So it, it, it's an easy way to get an entire company aligned against a single purpose. The question I get when I talk about that kind of stuff from CEOs is, why doesn't my mission statement do that? And, and the answer is your mission statement should do that. It's not a separate thing from a brand promise. The, the only real difference is that your mission statement speaks to the employees within your company and shareholders or potential shareholders where the brand promise speaks to your consumer or customer base, um, but they speak about the same thing. They just use different words because the audience is different and you need to communicate it in a uh, different way. So it, th that part of it has been a fascinating exploration. I don't want to overplay my consulting role. Frankly, I, I consulted with friends I, it was funny because a lot of my uh, former sales management colleagues at Procter & Gamble, um, after they retired, got jobs, but they were all jobs in marketing. And I would get these phone calls, hey, Ed, I need some help. <laughs> can she what can I do me? now? <laughs> yeah. So I said, you know, fine, whatever, I'll teach you. But, but again, it, it got me exposed to different business categories. So like my last client was in the cancer care category. Absolutely fascinating. How does branding translate into cancer care? And we had very good conversations about the cancer patient experience. And once we identified the brand promise for that cancer care group, it, it was an independent group of oncologists. So they, they weren't burdened by the restrictions that major hospital groups place on. So they were able to give a level of personalization mm -hmm. that just structurally the other, the competition could not. And once they understood that and the market research that we did demonstrated, that was a positive thing for patients then it allowed them to redesign their offices where the patient interactions occurred and the interface between the patient and as an example, the billing department or the front desk or whatever. But it, it gave them a singular focus as they started making these sorts of decisions aimed at trying to improve the personalization of the care that they provided. So, I mean, it's a powerful concept. It works. I just got to see it work over and over again. So I'm very confident what I've written makes a lot of sense and is easily applicable. So based on your understanding of what a brand is and based on your experience on what is the common with that misunderstanding and Shell is understanding about what a brand is, what is your definition of a good brand strategy? All right. I mean, a, a brand strategy, it's essentially a plan, a long-term plan, because branding is a long-term game. I'm into that. It's, yeah. It's not something you just do on a Monday and every, life is good. But it's a long-term plan that's focused on not only delivering the promise, but communicating it to a specific target audience, ensuring that it's, it comes to life at the key touch points that consumers or customers come in contact with your product or service or the process of getting your product or service. 
But it also covers ensuring that the promise remains relevant, competitive, and authentic over time. And it's the first part of what I talked about, I, I think everybody gets. They understand when I come up with a marketing plan, it covers a long period of time. I expect this year's marketing plan should be built up off of last year's marketing plan in the sense of its goals and aspirations, et cetera. But the piece that they often miss is this on remaining competitive, compelling, and authentic over time. And uh, one of the tricks, it wasn't really a trick, but one of the things that I used to do when I was running brands at Procter & Gamble is I had my mainline initiatives. So my mainline marketing plan, which talked about the marketing mix and why it was right, the messaging and why this particular campaign was right and had all the right metrics and all that kind of stuff. That was set over here. And then I had a separate initiative focused on development. So I put aside what I was doing and felt good about to go explore things that would take me to new levels. And that requires you to get deep into understanding where the consumer's needs are not being fully met or where the consumer needs are shifting over time. And I know this sounds a little complicated, but probably the best example of where consumer needs shift over time is in the interactive space. If you think about the internet five years ago versus the internet today, it's shifted dramatically in a very short period of time you have to be on top of that kind of thing. The other thing that it does is it brings the whole idea of product development into the mm. branding world. It's not this separate thing that sits out there. Okay. And you want to, to the extent that you can focus on development that furthers your brand promise that either makes it more competitive and compelling, or if think if the competition has come in with a superior technology or, or a superior promise, you know, that it gives you the opportunity to neutralize that or to go beyond it. Um, but it forces you to bring it into the branding discussion. It's not this, and I, I've seen this in many companies where product development sits separate from the marketing team and product development seems to have this mission of, I'm going to look at the world and try to figure out what the next big need is on consumers. And we're going to go off and try to develop a new product for that. Yeah, move, but you also need to figure out how to take your current products forward and that's where the big connection comes in. And if I may, I think uh, that's what actually Apple does very well in the consumer electronics space because they have this umbrella, which is the brand, uh, which defines certain characteristics. But they also uh, use design obsessively to understand consumer insight and they do foresight. And that's where the product development starts from. Whereas many other consumer electronics, they come and say, Ooh, 3D TV. Now find an insight and sell it. And it's, no, that's not the way it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard to develop a technology and find a market. It's easier to find a market and then to <laughs> develop a technology for it. Mm -hmm. Um, because that becomes a need driven research as opposed yeah. to research for the sake and of And then research. you have a I'm problem a of fan. the brand prone as a promise uh, where the products needs to deliver certain expectations, but then it's a moving target. The brand becomes a moving exactly. target. Exactly. And that's the worst scenario to be in. So anyway, to your question, a brand strategy is essentially a plan that takes a long-term view of where you want to take your brand promise 
and what is required to ensure that it remains competitive, compelling, and authentic over time. It's not the same as a, an advertising campaign by any stretch. And it needs to be tied into and supported, ideally supported by the a company strategic plan as well. And to the extent that the company is a, a one product company, that's very easy. Uh, to the extent that a company is a multi-product, multi-category company, that gets a bit more challenging. But nonetheless, it is no less important. It just needs to be articulated in a way that the board of directors understand. And it's like, why are we in this particular business? This is why. And this is how this business connects with all the other businesses uh, that we're in and, you know, why you should continue to feed this business with resources. So anyway, it, I don't want to make complicated things too simple, but on one level, it, it really is mm -hmm. fairly simple. No, the, the notion um, it's if simple. You, if the, you talk about the execution is not. Yes, that's the key. And I think what the book is all about, the book lays out simple principles, but I think in the book, I, I say, this is all easy, but execution is hard, you know, and that's where professionals come in. So I will tell you, one of the things that I was surprised at is the pushback I get from agencies and frankly, consultants uh, on the book for some reason. They don't see it the way I see it. They see it as somewhat competitive. If my client gets this book, then what, what role do I have? And my argument is no, it's just the opposite. It's enabling. If your client gets the book and reads it, then you have a whole new platform of understanding to talk to that client about the things that they really need to invest in that you're capable of delivering for them because you're past the, the basic explanation phase and now into the, hey, let me tell you about the kind of market research you need to go get. Let me tell you about why it's important that we relook at your package. Let me tell you why it's a key that we look at your campaign because it's not accomplishing these tasks. So I view the book as an enabler for the profession, but honestly, I'm having a hard time getting that point across. I can imagine. Going back to strategy and execution. So do you measure a good strategy or do you measure the execution of the strategy or both? Oh, absolutely. Of course, I'm biased. I come from Procter & Gamble. We measure everything. So yeah, I'm going to say yes, you have to measure. But I don't think a lot of people know how to measure effectively. So, and, and I don't think uh, people, I don't think companies necessarily have adequate money to measure. Okay, so with those as constraints, you have to be very smart in what you do measure. Um, from a big picture point of view, you end up, you know, when you look at sales results and I fundamentally believe that sales results are very important. You can have the prettiest, the, the most clever advertising campaign. If it's not delivering sales, it's all meaningless. Having said that, I think that when you look at a macro measure like sales, you're measuring the overall marketing mix, including if you have a uh, direct sales activities and things of that nature, I, I include that in the marketing mix. And that's one valid measure. You can see quarterly or monthly or whatever, whether you're progressing in the right direction, but it's a very blunt measure. It's not, it doesn't give you a lot of information. It gives you a, a good feeling about whether your current mix is being effective or not, but it doesn't tell you 
uh, how you can tweak it or how you can uh, dramatically change the trajectory of your sales efforts. I will say before I go on, in, in my, and I've had over three decades of experience now, the thing that changes the, the trajectory of a, of a brand, setting, setting aside a new to the world product, mm -hmm. The thing that changes the trajectory the most is a product improvement. There's nothing quite like a product improvement, particularly if it's a meaningful improvement, a consumer noticeable improvement, not just a cosmetic thing. If for you improvement can, if for you, you it's not a new benefit. For you, it's a it's better delivery new, it's a of better the existing delivery. benefit, yes. correct? Yes, it's a better delivery of the brand promise. It could be, it could range from a more efficient delivery all the way up to a more superior mm -hmm. delivery. Teeth whitening products, when they first came out, were not all that good. They were better than nothing, but they were not all that good. Um, there have been several innovations along the way that have dramatically improved the efficacy of teeth whitening products. Any change like that can make a dramatic shift in the sales curve. I call that out because I, I don't, the next part of the conversation, I don't want to put on the same level as something like that, because the next looking at the marketing mix and how we're communicating things and are we in the right uh, vehicles to communicate on those kinds of conversations are important, but improvements in those areas by and large are not going to cause a dramatic shift in sales. They're going to cause what I would position as continual improvement of your sales curve. Um, now, the way that we always measured was by doing extreme experiment. The company turns around and says, um, yeah, I want to see if my online presence, if I can improve that. So I'm going to spend 20% more in the online category, and then I'm going to measure the results. Am I getting more referrals, whatever valid measurement they want to look at? My position typically is you're not going to see anything it, because it's going to get lost in the noise. A 20% increase in spend in an in a area like online you're just not going to see it. A 200% increase in spend. Now we're talking. Now we have a right to, to expect to see something. And the theory behind that is, is an engineering theory, signal to noise ratio. If, if the signal isn't strong enough to break out of the noise, you have no hope of measuring it. And frankly, if you increase it by 20% and you do see something, I would question whether what you saw was real or just an artifact that in that particular month or two months or whatever. It, yeah, whether there is any blip. correlation between the signal and the output. Yeah, yeah. Which, which can get us into another discussion between cor correlation and causation. Exactly. But that, exactly. yeah, but only because I have a theoretical math background, so I get lost in that stuff. <laughs> but so at Procter & Gamble, we used to do extreme tests. Um, and as a consumer goods company, it was fairly easy. You would take a piece of geography and hold everything but one variable constant and then dramatically shift that variable and measure it over an appropriate length of time, which is not measured in years, to see if it made a difference at all. And if it did, then we would dive in to try to understand the causality. Why did that difference occur? And once we understood that, we were in a position to determine whether that was scalable or not. And, and obviously if it was scalable, then we would move it up to a national initiative. I don't think most companies in that kind of a position. So with the companies that I advised, I always told them, you need to have a predetermined test plan. So 
let's figure out where you think you can have the greatest impact by tweaking a variable and let's make that your test plan and let's do a quality job of figuring out how to test it. And, and that includes a quality job of figuring out the appropriate measures and then understanding how that connects to your sales funnel. Because if you can't explain it, and it's not even a matter of measuring it per se, it's just a matter of explaining it. If you can't even explain how you would expect changing this is going to impact the change in sales, then don't bother. It's funny because it's, it, it's hard enough it to measure. It reminds me of uh, why Hilton West PNG is so much better than other companies. It's because there is a dual focus not only on the what, yeah, but on the why. From a consumer point of yes. view, from an advertising point of view, from a media go to market, you, you you don't want just to describe the phenomena. You need to understand what is the causation between the two. Yes, yes. No, we're at Procter and Gamble. We're very big on answering the question why, because there are so many spurious correlations. I'm reminded of. Now, this is a little off topic, but way back when I was taking um, a math course, I took a statistics course in college, and the professor said um, that there was a, a major study that showed foot size is correlated to IQ test results. And then he went on to explain that the problem in the methodology was they didn't control for age. So all that the study actually showed is that the older you get, the smarter you get. Because the older you get, the bigger your foot got. It was, and I've always remembered that to say, yeah, you really do have to understand why something works um, to, to place your bet, essentially, on whether it's replicable or not. Because if you don't understand why, it, it's like going to the horse track and putting money down on a horse and hoping that you pick the right horse. That's a leisure activity. That's not running a business. Exactly. And, and it's risking your money in an unwise way. So Going back to the um, measuring, I think, in all honesty, one thing that bothers me in business these days or in talking about business is that there is this search for the North Star measure, one measure that explains everything. And unfortunately, business are a bit more complex than that. <laughs> you need to have a better context. Huh? More measures and, and sales works, brand equity measures on the other hand. Uh, we need to build awareness. Yeah, not only awareness, but awareness uh, for what? Uh, what is your message, you know? But uh, going back to that, on, based on your experience, and this is for me, it's the bridge between strategy and execution. What sets of measures and, more importantly, in which time frames you would go and say to a company, look, this is the minimum. Otherwise, you don't know what you're doing. Obviously, sales is going to be a measure. There's no getting around that. But sales is an end measure, not an in-process measure. It's an end-process measure. And, there, and let's talk a little bit about the difference between those two things. In-process measures are somewhat indirect. They give you a sense for whether you're heading in the correct direction. End-process measures are a look back to say, did I cross the finish line? in the way that I wanted to. So end process measures you can't do anything about. The game is over. In process measures you theoretically can do something about because if you're off track, you have an opportunity to try to get it back on track. In the branding game, we have a lot more in process measures than end process measures. We do have some end process measures. I'm a big fan of a brand equity monitor. My problem with a brand equity monitor is I don't think it's used appropriately, but I think it serves a very valuable function. Knowing what the uh, 
perception of your brand is at any point in time is very important. And I view that as an image measure. You could argue it's an in-process measure because you have time, presumably, to change it. But frankly, if it comes back negative, you may not have as much time as you think. So I like brand equity monitors. I use on my brands at Procter & Gamble, we did it annually. When I was managing the Ohio brand, uh, we went out every six months. An interesting thing about the brand equity monitor, frankly, if the brand equity monitor is not designed around the brand promise, then you're wasting your time because you're just collecting information for the sake of collecting information. If the brand equity monitor does, does not include your primary competition, you're wasting your time because you're just talking to yourself. So you want to know how your product is perceived relative to, uh, because that's the only way you can make a decision. Um, with the state of Ohio, I did it every six months because when I, I did the first brand equity monitor, I came back with a, a conclusion that was counterintuitive. Um, most of the elected officials in Ohio felt that the state, so think of it as the brand, was perceived negatively. And the brand equity monitor that I ran came back and, and advised us essentially that it wasn't perceived negatively at all. It was just never thought about. So all the things that, that they thought were real positive about the state were essentially neutral. You know, Which is sometimes is the, the worst case scenario, by the way. Negative. It wasn't, it wasn't, because everything negative that they thought about the state was essentially neutral. You know, when I told the governor at the time, I said, I got good news and I got bad news. The bad news is nobody thinks about Ohio. They don't think positively. They don't think negatively. They just don't think about it. I said, the good news is I was born and raised in New York and we brag about everything. I'm here to fix that problem for you. And, and so we ran it every six months to see if we were making progress in, in moving perception towards the brand promise that we pulled out of the research. So I like brand equity monitors. I think they have a, an important role to play. I would encourage any company with a reasonable market research budget to run a brand equity monitor on an annual basis. Having said that, I would also encourage them to get it well-designed and I would encourage them to pay an outside professional to interpret the result because the, it, it's too subject to internal bias for everybody will read into it what they want. And I, and I have found that coming from the outside, it's easier uh, when you don't have an agenda to, mm -hmm. to actually interpret right. the data. The other measures as you go along are, tend to be tactical measures. If you have a, a website um, and, it, and it has an opportunity to, to click for additional information, click-throughs is a good, good measure. Yeah, okay. But click-throughs don't necessarily translate into trial or a purchase or, or whatever. So all of those in-process measures have to be evaluated with the paradigm that they give you a perspective, but are not definitive. So you could quadruple your click-through rate. And I see a lot of SEO agencies trying to make their money on that basis. Come play Ross and We'll make sure that you get higher click-through rates and whatever. And it's okay, nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to hire an SEO agency to increase your click-through rates, to what end? <clears throat> what happens after somebody clicks through? Is the issue really your click-through rate or is the issue more that you're not doing anything productive with the people that do click through. I view those in-process measures as instructional, necessary, because it's foolish not to measure, but not definitive. Now, the ultimate definitive measures 
the end process measure of sales. It is very hard for a marketer to argue if a if the sales are declining year over year, it's hard to argue that the branding initiative is working. That's just, just incontrovertible. Mm -hmm. And it, if it if you're losing money, you're losing money. So yeah, I think that everybody should have a measurement plan in place, but they need to properly evaluate the measures and, and not hang their hat on one or another. Commercial, same thing. Unfortunately, at Procter & Gamble, I saw what I thought were some outstanding campaigns killed because they didn't meet our minimal um, measurement threshold uh, when they were test marketed. Um, it copy testing. So I think so. and some of those measures can get in the way of innovation as well. True. And the speaking about time frames, what is based on your experience practicing ML, but also in the case of Ohio? When do you see between what's the time frame between doing an activity, campaign, event, PR? whatever it is, and finding a result measure, what's the time frame that you expect in fast-moving consumer goods or building the Ohio brand? Yeah, it's a hard question to answer in general, but my general answer would be think in terms of months, not days and weeks. But having said that, if we were to do an in-store initiative, so it's a two-day event, yeah, I'd expect to see an impact within that week because it's that's what that kind of an event is designed for. If it's a new advertising campaign, no, I would expect months because it takes time for people to get exposed to it, to internalize it, et cetera. I will say with Ohio, uh, once we defined the brand promise, and we launched an advertising campaign, um, a little more background, our primary target audience were corporate executives. We're in a position to make a capital investment decision. Once we launched the campaign, we literally saw results the first year. So you, you can see results, I won't say relatively quickly, because it all depends on what you're talking about, what's quick. I think changing the capital investment profile of a state within a year is fast. That may not be fast for a small business who's looking to move product out the door. Um, they might not be able to wait a year. It depends on what you're and doing. On the cycle, on the business again, cycle as well. So yeah, you know what I'm saying? And not to belabor the point, but if a coupon program, I would expect to see results within weeks because you have to give a, a little bit of time for a, a transaction to occur. But I wouldn't drop a coupon initiative in January and be very comfortable if by March I haven't seen anything. So it's tactically dependent. Exactly. Cool. This is the end of our episode today. You can catch the rest of this interview in the next episode. Thank you very much for listening.